Jerry Jones proved just how much a gamble can pay off. On February 25th, 1989, he bought the Dallas Cowboys as they were in the midst of some tough times. He replaced franchise cornerstones Tom Landry and Tex Schramm with Jimmy Johnson and himself. Led by Michael Irvin and first overall pick Troy Aikman, Dallas stumbled out of the gate to a one-win season, but quickly got some help. An infusion of talent headlined by Emmitt Smith graced the Cowboys thanks to one of the NFL's most brilliant trades ever. What holes they couldn't patch through the draft, they fixed elsewhere. Tight end Jay Novacek came over in free agency. And when San Francisco grew tired of his antics, Charles Haley joined Dallas via trade. Alongside Leon Lett and Russell Maryland, Haley helped turn the defense into a terror. Running the ball was made far easier behind the Great Wall of Dallas. Eric Williams further solidified a line led by Mark Tuine and Nate Newton, which meant Smith was able to do as he pleased. As a bonus, he had Daryl Johnston paving the way. And in just the fourth season with Jones at the helm, the Cowboys put it all together. They blew out the Bills for the franchise's first Lombardi trophy since Super Bowl XII. A year later, they did it again, same opponent and all. After a coaching change that we'll get to later and an early exit thanks to the eventual champs, Jones showed he wasn't content with just two Super Bowls. He brought in Deion Sanders, upgrading an already stout secondary led by Darren Woodson. And after a fourth straight season of at least 12 wins, Dallas won Jerry a third Super Bowl. He had turned the franchise around and put them in position to keep rolling. But about that. Barely a month after Super Bowl 30, part of what defined America's team once again spilled into public view, dysfunction. On March 3rd, 1996, Dallas police entered a hotel room that contained, among other things, lots of weed, plenty of coke, a pair of self-employed models, and Michael Irvin. When the cops entered, the first thing Irvin offered was, can I tell you who I am? He was a national champion with Jimmy Johnson's Miami Hurricanes. He was Tom Landry's final first round pick. As Jeff Perlman put it in Boys Will Be Boys, he was the reason for the Cowboys dynasty. The police didn't need an introduction, but Irvin knew that. This is the guy who once said, my greatest asset is my ego. If there was a personification of the Dallas Cowboys other than Jerry Jones, it had to be Irvin. And as he sat in the hotel room two days before his 30th birthday, there couldn't be a more obvious omen for the franchise. But one of the women claimed possession of everything in the room. Irvin made a plea deal and avoided a prison sentence. He dodged an extortion attempt from an alleged rando, then a murder plot by the boyfriend of the woman who took the fall. But Irvin couldn't slip past a suspension from Commissioner Tagliabue. Their title defense took another hit when Russell Maryland left for Oakland. He was the latest of many examples as to what the NFL's recently introduced free agency could do to a team as talented as the Cowboys. But with his first-hand experience, Maryland knew Dallas could get through whatever obstacles they set in their own way. The money saved by letting the defensive tackle walk was then put straight into their running back's pocket. Smith was extended on a massive deal that included a record signing bonus but it was a little less eye-popping when compared to the similar size stacks of cash given to Aikman and Sanders. Jones was investing in his team and looked to lock up the nucleus that had brought him success. He was just banking on the hope that everyone could stay healthy, happy, and at the top of their game. The bad news, it didn't play out like that. But the following year, they did manage to win the NFC East, so there's that. It just came amidst further drama. They spent the 1996 season working around an ongoing beef between their franchise quarterback and head coach. Whether it was trust issues stemming from that or a three-time Super Bowl hangover, the offense took a major step back. And in December, the defense they had to lean on more than normal lost one of their anchors due to a drug-related suspension. With all that, they somehow managed a wildcard win over the Vikings, but then came up short against Carolina. For the first time in five years, they failed to make the NFC Championship game. Part of the struggle came from the fact that they were without their star tight end for the entire year. Novacek had missed the season due to a degenerative disc in his lower back, 
and during the offseason, Aikman's safety valve decided to call it a career. Along with him went Haley, who, despite all of his off-the-field stunts, had given Dallas what it needed for success. Losing a leader from both sides of the ball was a tough pill to swallow, and Jones was doing what he could to not let the train slip off the tracks. But preventing derailment can be costly. Jerry locked up Daryl Johnston to a massive deal. For context, here's how it compared to the extension signed by Irvin just two years prior. That was gifted to Moose without many competing offers coming his way. Jones said simply, we owed him that contract. And as Peter King put it, it was a giant step for an organization that was otherwise spiraling. Johnston himself added, I think there's a feeling among the guys in the weight room that the bad days are over for us. Moose. Sorry, bud. They're not. Not long before the season kicked off, Barry Switzer was arrested for having a handgun in his luggage at the airport. That was added to a list of complaints against Switzer, including those expressed from Aikman directly to the team's owner, as well as incidents like Switzer getting flagged for contact with an official that helped seal their defeat in the 94 NFC Championship. The arrest kicked off a season where the Cowboys were truly spiraling. Their offense was a mess, due in part to some career-threatening injuries to some of the guys who had kept Aikman clean and let Smith rack up rushing titles. A knee injury to Mark Tuine shortened his season and led to his retirement in the offseason. It was another crack in the Great Wall. Even with the behemoth Larry Allen filling some of the void, the Cowboys struggled to score and therefore struggled to win. It was the first losing season of Switzer's coaching career and his last season in Dallas. With that, he resigned, and Jerry made it clear that he wasn't pleased with what the coach had done to his team. But Switzer would have had to have been perfect to keep Jones happy. Jerry had been looking to prove a point with the position of head coach. The Cowboys had become the success that they were because of Jones, not whoever was coaching the team. And while Switzer had to fall on the sword of dysfunction, it was his predecessor that helped cause the storm. Jimmy Johnson was by Jones' side as the Cowboys were rebuilt. He did more than his share in getting them into Super Bowl form. And in Jones' eyes, he got more than his share of the credit. In a now famous alcohol-fueled interaction with some sports writers, Jerry made his feelings clear. Johnson didn't do anything that any other coach couldn't do. He could bring anyone else in and have success. But Johnson had his own thoughts on the matter. While Jerry was the one who signed the checks, Johnson made sure they were getting the most out of the players. In his mind, this was his team, and he'd coach for as long as he felt like it, allegedly telling Jones as much on a flight home following a win. It was no surprise that they couldn't find a way to keep working together, and a split became necessary. So when Switzer walked into the organization, it was egos from top to bottom, and when he left, not much had changed. Well, I sort of take that back. One thing did change. They had a happy quarterback again. On February 12th, 1998, the unheralded Chan Gailey was announced as the new head coach. Aikman said that the hire was a sign of good things ahead, a statement he likely would have made even if Jerry had named himself coach. And there were those that believed this move was actually Jones doing just that. His love of football plus his confidence in himself had led Jones to be more hands-on than most in his position. But few had had the success that graced Jerry almost immediately. It's easy to understand why he believed this team ran through him. Credit is due for the success, but also for the drama that this team, much like Jones, had a flair for. And unfortunately, that was again on display during the 1998 offseason. Offensive lineman Everett McIver was getting his haircut during training camp when Irvin rolled in. The receiver shouted seniority and expected McIver to get out of the chair. With teammates standing around, Irvin continued yelling at McIver, who eventually got up and shoved him. After even Leon Lett couldn't break them up, McIver punched Irvin in the mouth. That's when the wide receiver grabbed a pair of scissors and slashed McIver across the neck leaving a room full of their teammates silent. The offensive lineman would be all right after a hospital stay, and thanks to Jerry, Irvin avoided criminal charges. 
Plus, a judge ruled that this didn't violate the terms of the wide receiver's probation that stemmed from the hotel incident. My favorite part is the judge calling it playful. And for Dallas, the drama didn't end once football began. In week two, Aikman suffered a broken collarbone during a blowout loss against the Broncos. The Cowboys were forced to lean on backup Jason Garrett, who actually handled himself pretty well. As far as what they could do on the field, this was a good team. Dion proved he was still primetime, Smith got back on track for his best season since their last Super Bowl run, and Aikman returned halfway through the year to show what Gailey's offense was capable of. They became the first NFC East team to ever sweep the division. Those eight wins helped Dallas get back into the playoffs. But against the rival Cardinals on wildcard weekend, third time was the charm for Arizona. Dallas was left with even more questions about their future. Aikman admitted to the natural shifts of the NFL, how this wasn't the team it used to be. Sanders added that no one should be happy with how they played, and said it's time for some guys to step up or step out. One of the guys who chose the latter was Nate Newton. The career-long cowboy had seen age get the better of him, and instead of sticking around for a backup role, opted to join Carolina. The Great Wall had crumbled, and the team's on-field identity was in trouble. Their off-field identity remained well intact, though, once again thanks to Lett. It was the third time since 1995 that substance abuse violations would keep him off the field. But hopes somehow remained high, and expectations hadn't changed for this team. The start of the 1999 season looked like they were capable of another run. It's just they're getting a collapse episode for a reason. While visiting Philadelphia in week five, in the first quarter, Michael Irvin caught a pass as he had 749 other times in his career. Trying to avoid a helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit, he came down awkwardly on the artificial turf. With little padding between Irvin and the cement beneath the turf, he suffered a cervical spinal cord injury. And as the Eagles crowd cheered, the stretcher was brought out. Just that morning, the Philadelphia Inquirer published a piece by Phil Sheridan that credited the job Jones and the Cowboys organization had done in maintaining the triplets. But that snap would be the last of Irvin's career. And with the trio down to two, the Cowboys got a glimpse of their future just a few weeks later. Aikman suffered another concussion. Smith broke a bone in his hand. And for the first time since 1988, the Cowboys would be without all three of their biggest stars. That was on top of a neck injury to Daryl Johnston, which being his second in three seasons meant his time as a Cowboy was also over. While Moose was never going to threaten Emmett for touches, he was a leader of the team and beloved by the organization as well as the fan base. The team was suddenly becoming unrecognizable. They managed to sneak into the playoffs at 8-8, eight and eight, but it was over quickly against the Vikings. And from there, things started to speed up. Right after the early exit, Jerry chased another coach out of town. He promoted longtime defensive coach Dave Campo, then once again gambled for the future by sending two first round picks to Seattle in exchange for Joey Galloway. Upon arrival, he received a massive deal in hopes of filling the void at wide receiver. But that meant they had to save cash elsewhere, and Sanders played the victim. Primetime had showed up and kept the good times going, but was quickly another big name moving on. Things only got worse with Campo as head coach. After the first of three straight 5-11 seasons, some of the last remnants of those Super Bowl teams found new homes. Eric Williams moved on to the Ravens. Leon Lett became a Bronco. And the team made the tough but expected decision to say farewell to their franchise quarterback. Dallas waived Aikman the day before a seven-year, $70 million extension would have kicked in. A month later, injuries forced him to officially retire, but he'd still be on the books for nearly 15% of the Cowboys' salary cap. The highlight of the Campo era came when Smith broke Walter Payton's record for career rushing yards. But even one of the greatest careers a running back has ever had wouldn't be enough to save Smith. Like everyone else, time had caught up to Emmett. He'd averaged nearly 350 touches per season over his 13 years as a Cowboy, and that's before adding postseason play. As a result, his effectiveness slowed in a way that mirrored the direction of Dallas. 
After yet another coaching change, Smith's time as a cowboy was over. And other than Jerry, only one name remained from that first Super Bowl team. Darren Woodson managed just one more season before a herniated disc led to his retirement at the end of 2004. With that, the dynasty was officially over. By the time Woodson played his last snap, the Cowboys were 10 games below 500 since their last Super Bowl. And now, Jones had no one left to share the credit or the blame. He was left to pick up the pieces and try to resurrect the franchise for a second time. After chasing championships, big names, and anyone who got in his way, he'd get to try it all again. But through the hard times, the success still shined bright, even with all the distractions that piled up along the way. The collapse of America's team, it felt massive, but only because of how incredible their time on top truly was. Hey, thanks for watching. Since you're still here, I bet you'll enjoy our collapse episode about the greatest show on turf. Upon completion, please write a 10 page paper double spaced and send it to roger.goodell at aol.com, which will enter you into his mailing list of boomer memes. Or just check out this video, subscribe to SB Nation, and make sure you hit the bell for notifications.